Hey everyone, how's it going? As you all know, I do love uh, exploring and building new decks. However, as you notice as of late, my decks have been rather derivative and conventional. Well, every once in a blue moon, I come up with something crazy, something balls to the walls innovative. And today is one of those days, and I'd love to share with you what I found. So sit back and relax as I take you through the world of the turtle that could. The turtle, uh, or Makua, more affectionately, affectionately known to me as Seymour the turtle, is a very interesting icebreaker and netrunner because unlike most other icebreakers, you cannot increase its strength by paying credits during a run. Instead, it has various other conditions uh, for which uh, it will increase strength, but most notably, you will need to um, add virus counters to it one way or another, uh, and there are a couple of ways to do this. While Seymour the turtle is rather slow and likes to take its own time, make no mistake, it is a competitive icebreaker that a lot of tier 1 players use, and what they do is that they take Omakua for a swim. They swim through servers here and there, seeking out virus counters, feeding them to Omakua so that it gets really big, strong, and powerful. Because you need to successfully swim through the servers, Omakua is the strongest in the early game when the corporation does not have any ice to freeze Omakua in its tracks. So with that, uh, with that knowledge, typically what happens with Seymour the Turtle is that you can get it going fairly well early on. It get its, it, you know, its hunger insatiable. It keeps getting fed and fed, and then one fine day when the corp finally assembles all the defenses it needs to keep Omakua out, bam! The tsunami strikes. The corp purges virus counters. Our poor Seymour the turtle is washed ashore, back to its original form, unable to tackle the mess of ice in front of it. Well, today we'll be exploring how to recover from such a setback and to make Omakua wonderful and uh, very powerful as our main breaker. The first thing you'll notice is that to purge virus counters, that is a corp action and there is a way we can punish that with the current card pool. That's right, we are going to jank town here because we are going to use this card that is otherwise binder fodder. Fester forces the corp to give up two credits when they purge virus counters. Now you'll notice that Fester is not a unique card, so the, run the runner can run three copies of this, forcing the corp to lose up to six credits per purge, and this is a big deal. This uh, changes the expected payout or expected value EV of um, purging virus counters. Um, you know, make it makes it worse. Uh, it yeah, not favorable for the corp, and that's a very big deal. If you can deter the corp from pur pur purging virus counters. Your same or the turtle has more time to live. Contaminate is another wonderful card that adds 3 strength right off the back to Omakua. That's a very powerful boost considering that during normal runs you can only get uh, plus 1 strength at most from one added virus counter. The catch is however that Contaminate only works on viruses that have no existing virus counters. So that might seem like a downside but don't forget our whole objective is to get past the purge. The purge is what we are most worried about and that is the Achilles, uh, Achilles heel of our work. Contaminate shows that up very nicely. It is a loose dust card for us and it's very useful. It, it does an amazing job at doing that. In fact, it seems it almost seems as if that Contaminate was designed solely to be played with all the cool work. So, uh, it's just a very natural synergy, and what a card that we should play if Omakua is to be our main breaker. We know that it's an event, and hence it's only single use. However, if um, yeah, uh, and that could be a problem. But as we mentioned earlier, as long as we have festers up, contaminate becomes fine. The problem with contaminate normally is that. After a turn in which you use Contaminate, the port will simply perch again and you're back to the same spot as you were one turn ago, except that you don't have to Contaminate anymore. So Contaminate is a pretty bad one use card simply because the port can simply perch again. However, if the port attempts to do so with Fester out, that 
drains the credits while they are purging and that is really bad for them. Uh, it could put them out of range of raising their ice and that's a, the key part about this deck. We want to keep the top four so that uh, if we can't raise the ice, we can start swimming through their servers again and farming all the cool counters the usual way. We also note that Contaminate is only one influence and that is flashable, right? Uh, it's very cheap of influence and that's going to actually be very important when we get to the deck building phase later. Uh, Deuces Wow is another amazing card for Omakua because it secretly gives 2 strength to Omakua. The last effect, expose 1 piece of ice and make a run, has the potential to gain 2 strength for Omakua because the expose uh, triggers the plus 1 virus counter and making a run and accessing but not stealing any cards or trashing any cards allows you to gain yet another virus counter for a total of 2. So that's a very efficient way to pump up the Omakua. Right? Efficient methods are very important because if you are only gaining one virus counter on Omakua per click, uh, the court can easily match you click for click by purging virus counters every turn. So this is why um, Deuces Wow and Contaminate are especially valuable in recharging Omakua after a purge, and Fester is there to ensure that the court doesn't uh, purge too frequently. Next thing you want to notice is there is a very interesting synergy between Omakua and Gang Sign. Gang Sign triggers counts separately towards Omakua's virus gain effect. This means that if you have say 3 copies of Gang Sign installed, each Gang Sign counts as a separate access, thus you get 1 virus counter for each gang sign, assuming of course that you don't trash or steal the access card. And that is very crucial because gang sign triggers when an agenda is scored. This bypasses any defenses, any ice that the corp has. So in effect, you, are, you now have yet another trigger uh, to get virus counters on Omakua uh, that doesn't rely on running through ice when Omakua is on zero strength. And that's very important in uh, recovering from a purge. Gang sign doubles up as a very useful form of HQ pressure. It allows you to steal agendas from HQ without actually accessing or running HQ. And that's amazing because I, uh, courts can typically put a lot of ice on HQ. Now, gang sign by itself is not very good for the simple reason that a lot of corps nowadays simply keep their HQ agenda free. Whenever they draw an agenda, it immediately goes into scoring remote. Well, this is where another criminal card comes into play. Uh, yeah, we are going to look at Fisk Investment Stamina as well. This card is usually bad for the runner. Accelerating the corpse game is, game is never something you want to do, but in conjunction with Gang Sign, it's a deadly combo for corpse who are not prepared to deal with a gender flood. Um, yeah, I know we are looking at a lot of janky cards so far. Contaminate, Fester, Fisk Investment Seminar, and Gang Sign taking up your restricted slot when that could have been spent on something like an employee strike. Is this going to be a good deck? Who knows? Well, one thing's for sure though, we need to make up for the fact that we are playing so many janky cards by playing some actually good cards. As mentioned when we were talking about Fester, this deck is heavily reliant on denying the opponent money. Without money, your corp cannot res big ice, which means that they cannot keep Omakua out. As long as they don't get to res big ice on all their servers, we will always find a way in, and that means we can always charge our Omakua. To that end, we have various credit denial cards all from the criminal faction. Diversion of funds and emergency shutdown are by far the strongest of the lot, uh, being able to sap 5 or more credits from the runner for a single card. Um, pad tap also does the job, uh, costing the corp 3 credits to trash, uh, otherwise um, you will gain lots of money with pad tap, which is obviously very useful. And finally, 419's ability is absolutely amazing, even though uh, it gives the runner some agency, it gives the runner the ability to make the decision that benefits them the most. Unfortunately for the runner, in the context where we are playing 419 in, this is a lose-lose decision. Either they lose money as the run as the corp, or they concede to the runner uh, Omakua counters. So yeah, they are either gonna let Omakua pump strength, uh, and that allows Omakua to run rampant across all their servers, or they lose money and are not able to res set ice anyway. So that is the deck. 
Uh, there's some other interesting cards in here. You will notice. I'll quickly go through them. Lamb is our backup breaker in case we true well and truly get locked out. But really, ideally, we shouldn't be using Lamb at all. Um, it also helps deal with uh, ice like Swordsman uh, and code gates that uh, that cannot be broken by AI breakers, which we otherwise cannot break. Uh, Ngolo is better for this purpose, but it costs more influence. Uh, what other interesting cards are there? Uh, run base engine is uh, because we are denying the corp money. Ideally, the corp stays so poor that they aren't able to rest ice, allowing us to get lots of money off runs. To that end, Paragon and Cuban can put in some work in gaining us money. Paragon additionally filters through our deck, which is really important considering that there are lots of duplicate cards we might not need and that our draw engine isn't the best. Um, yep, that's about it, I believe. So, yeah, very interesting, very different from what I usually play. Doesn't look like a tier 1 deck at all. Well, there's only one way to find out if it is. Let's take dear little Seymour for a swim. Today we are up against Sports Metal. This is honestly one of the best matchups you can ever get. Not because Sports Metal is a weak opponent per se, but because there are lots of nasty other nasty decks out there in the wild um, that we are not very good against. Anyway, our opening hand looks like complete utter garbage. Um, we are almost always mulliganing for an Omakua. Any other money cards in our hand are gravy. The most important thing with this deck is to actually get down the turn 1 Omakua so that your ID ability actually does something more than uh, you know, just giving you information. It also charges up your Omakua. Now our opponent begins with exposing uh, the server 1 card which is Ginger City Grid. So this is one of the nice things about 419. You don't need to run server 1 to check if it's a Rashida or not. We know there's a Ginger Grid, we know we don't have the money to contest it, We'll just let it go. So uh, the turn one play typically here is to get a credit, drop your Omakua, drop your daily cast, and then run to get one Omakua counter. Uh, we ran the open R&D where we saw Seder the active barrier, which immediately goes onto the remote thanks to Ginger Grid. So now we know that the remote is uh, almost uncontestable. That Seder adaptive barrier is going to be of, of pretty high strength. Uh, our turtle will have much difficulty contesting it. The main objective of this early game uh, is to actually get up to six advanced, uh, six, uh, <laughs> six virus counters on Omakua so that we can easily diversion of funds into HQ. Now, against other corps, you don't need to wait all the way to six, but HB has this one annoying ice called Gatekeeper which can really screw you over. So typically against other corps, I would just blind diversion of funds into HQ. The chances of them having an end to run ice on HQ are very marginal. However, against Sports Metal, you have to respect the three of Gatekeeper in the deck. So we kind of have to wait until we get six virus counters. So I'm trying to snap down as many cards as possible that allow me to get vi uh, virus counters. And uh, Gang Sign is a very good start. Uh, I can allow my opponent to score one agenda. Um, as long as it's not too impactful of an agenda, and I'll get some virus counters while at it. Uh, every turn, I'm also getting drip virus counters from 419's ability as my opponent continues revealing their remote ice. They're not going to prevent the expose since Ginger is already going to reveal the identity of the ice anyway, and they insert something in the Ginger remote which could be an agenda, so I'm just going to drop more gang signs here. Um, yeah, uh, somehow or another I managed to draw all three copies of my gang signs uh, in the top 10 cards of my deck, so down they go. I'm super poor at this point, but I really cannot risk running any server when uh, I could potentially stumble into a gatekeeper. Now, gatekeeper's not the worst ice because if you stumble into it, well, you can get out and it'll reset to zero strength in subsequent turns. However, I don't really fancy the idea of my opponent shuffling agendas back into the deck. So I'm just going to play it slow here as I draw into some interesting money cards in the form of Q-Bun. Q-Bun, okay. So you can't really drop Q-Bun blind. You would most want to install Q-Bun on an already rest ice, but because we are so timid and afraid of checking, we are forced to install Q-Bun on unrest ice, which is sub- uh, suboptimal because the corp can easily just install over your Cuban ice and trash your Cuban. So you have just wasted your Cuban install there. 
Um, normally, you would queue ban HQ ICE because you're running HQ often between diversion of funds and emergency shutdown. The reason I queue ban R&D here is because I did not want my opponent to put too many ICE on HQ. It's as simple as that. Uh, typically, uh, once you see a queue ban down as the corp, you would be tempted to fortify whichever server is being queue banned. So, it's hosting queue ban. So, in this case, I would rather my opponent defend R&D because I don't see myself running R&D very often. I want HQ to remain as open as possible because they don't really know what my deck is up to. Uh, they don't know that HQ is my route to victory because I want to run HQ early and often. For those diversion of funds, uh, for those single accesses, for those turning wheel counters, and yeah, just causing a lot of disruption with emergency shutdown. So, uh, yeah. So somehow or another, I managed to induce my opponent to installing the ice on R&D, and thankfully they did not override my Q-Ban, so that's really lovely. Alright, we have four, uh, four vi virus counters on Omakua. The Hungry Hungry Turtle is definitely fattening up, but it still has a way to go. I could easily run Archives twice, followed by a diversion of funds into HQ. That doesn't seem like a very efficient use of my time, however. Um, instead, I rather draw up, and I see a Fisk Investment Seminar. Ooh, interesting card, okay. Uh, this is a card that we could cert most certainly use in upcoming turns. I'm now going to mirror the Q-Ban, this time on HQ, and we'll test their patience. Uh, they have been leaving the advanced card in the remote to incubate for a while. Let's see if they actually score it. They sure do. Alright, they're going to score a 4 advancement agenda. It is a corporate sales team. Alright, this is not an agenda we want to see. As mentioned, if our opponent is rich, we are in trouble. We need to deny money. Uh, if they are on 16 credits and they have another 10 coming off sales team, you know you're in trouble. There's not much you can do about that, but I will get 3 HQ accesses from the 3 gang signs. The first access is a Rashida Jahim. Uh, I chose not to trash it here because if trashing it entails not getting an Omakua counter, and I really want to get up to 6. Uh, so I second gang sign accesses a Rashida, third gang sign accesses a Rashida. What the heck? Is JNet bug or what? They have 8 cards in hand and I access the same Rashida 3 times? What? Okay, um, awkward. Um, okay, well, whatever the case is, we now have 7 virus counters on Omakua. We chose not to trash any of the Rashidas. Uh, somehow JNet is bugged and did not give me the virus counters. It really should. Uh, do correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, so this coming turn, I'm definitely going to diversion of funds into HQ now that I my Omakua is fully charged up. But, 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 we have a priority event in our hand. We have the Fisk Investment Seminar, and this is a perfect time to fire Fisk um, right after they scored an agenda and ditch a bunch of cards. Make them draw more cards that they have to ditch, so now they'll be flooded with agendas. This is exactly what you want when you're running lots of gang signs. You want the agendas to pile up in hand, pile up in archives, so uh, that will do you a lot of good. Right, the gang signs will be super effective. Uh, turns out that the Fisk Investment Seminar did not proc any ginger install, so we're going straight for the diversion of funds here. We note that we cannot break all three subroutines of whatever ice that hits us. So if it's a say a Fairchild 3, for example, we will be forced to trash one of our gang signs. But thankfully it's a, exactly two subroutines. The gatekeeper that I feared the most, that really was the ice on HQ. So we are so happy, so thankful that we did not blind diversion of funds earlier because it would have fizzled and they would have managed to shuffle their agendas back into their R&D. So that was a successful diversion of funds and suddenly they're now down to 9 credits. We also gain some money from the Q-Ban, we gain some money from the Paragon, so we are rich enough to now contest HQ again. Running HQ is free, it costs us 2 credits but we get a 2 credit rebate from Q-Ban and we steal a project Vitruvius along the way. So far so good, that is looking pretty good for us. Um, our opponent now continues their turn, unfortunately for them, they now have 8 cards in hand and only 3 clicks to get rid of them. Uh, they are not that rich, 12 credits is a lot, but when you have 4 ice on your remote, well, they need a lot of credits to reds. So that's a bit of trouble that my opponent has to deal with. They install another piece of ice on HQ so I can't get free HQ runs, which is a smart idea. Unfortunately for them, it's an architect, expensive to res, only 2 credits tax for my Omakua. Uh, revealing the identity of the HQ ice is also very good in case I draw into a diversion of funds later on. I can always blind diversion into HQ, knowing that the HQ uh, the knowing the identity of the HQ ice. 
Uh, my opponent also plays IPO here, so now they're filthy rich. This credit denial plan isn't really working out, is it? They can definitely afford to rest a lot of ice. And we are not exactly rich ourselves either, only on 8 credits. We have to manage our credits very carefully, but thankfully, a dirty laundry arrives just in time, so we can dirty laundry into R&D here. Seeing, uh, we can break up to 2 triple subroutine ice, so 2 fetch out 3s for example will be easily breakable. So we are going to break the first fetch out 3, and we'll continue into the second ice. Uh, let's see if they bother resing it. Whether they res it or not, I'm going to get a 2 credit rebate from Cuban and a 1 credit from Paragon. So. You know, all the extra credits adding up here. Five more credits coming from the Dirty Laundry as well. So a lot of run-based economy in this deck paying off. My opponent doesn't rest the Inner Ice curiously. And I access, uh, first I Paragon and I see a Fisk Investment Stamina. I would love to flood my opponent's hand with triple gang sign on the table. So I'm going to leave the Fisk on top of my deck. And I access an IP block, very important to note, because that is a good counter to Omakua. We also know that Fetch Out 3 is 6 to res, that's a very expensive piece of ice, it would be a shame if it got de res by emergency shutdown. That's exactly what's going to happen here, with my second Dirty Laundry, I run into HQ, knowing that it's only 2 credits net to break, uh, but gaining 3 off the Dirty Laundry, that's a pretty good trade, and I even get a HQ access off of it. Let's see what we get here. Rashida Jahim, this time I trash it. Uh, now that I'm not concerned about virus counters anymore, my Omakua is well and truly charged up. So Rashida goes in the bin, and my opponent shows IP block on server 1 installed by Ginger City Grid. This is very good to see. I would much rather IP block be on the remote than be on one of the centrals, because that means that would make hammering centrals really difficult. My opponent scores a Vitruvius here, so I get 3 gang sign accesses. One is a Vitruvius that I steal. Um, and sports metal triggers here, they draw more cards, so that means more agendas for me to steal. I see biotech labor and remote enforcement immediately putting me on match point, and they trigger sports metal again, this time for credits. Wow, okay, those gang signs are really paying off. Let's try to win the game by running off R&D and getting single accesses. They re res their fetch out 3 here, we break it. Again, this is a very nice, handsomely ping run, because the Cuban is sitting in the innermost ice, gaining us 2 credits, and basically negating the Fairchild 3 rest costs. Uh, we draw into our Fisk Investment Seminar again, so I made a mistake here. What I should have done was to click 1, draw the Fisk Investment Seminar that I knew was on top of my deck, and then second click run R&D so that I would get a fresh Paragon trigger. Instead, I saw the same Fisk Investment Seminar with Paragon twice. Uh, had I done it the correct way, I would have seen the second Fist Investment Seminar using Paragon's ability and I would have buried it instead of keeping it in hand. So yeah, uh, still very important to you know try not to uh, have your Paragon trigger on the same topmost card of your deck. Uh, that's not very efficient. And whatever the case is, our opponent is probably not going to win off the next agenda, so I'm just going to continue flooding the hand with agendas that I can steal later on. Uh, they can uh, they can choose to install with Ginger Grid, but they choose not to. I draw into a second diversion of funds that immediately gets played. It's definitely worth it to divert funds when it only costs 2 credits to get into head HQ. 1 actually if you consider the Par Paragon's ability. So Paragon sees the turning wheel. That is a card I definitely want to see. That's the one card missing from my rig. And I wipe them down to 3 credits. So they did put a Fairchild 2 on Archives the last turn. You can clearly see what they're trying to go for there. They are trying to <coughs> turtle up. <laughs> yeah, so typically what you do against Omakua is you ice all your servers and then purge virus counters as my opponent does here. That's called turtling up and it's a pretty uh, effective means of shutting turtle out. Except that I have the exact cards needed in hand to counter it. I've been saving these cards in my hand for this exact reason. As soon as they purge, I contaminate the armor quirk, goes up to 3 virus counters, and I do the expose run combo. This gives me 1 virus counter for the expose, and by running archives here, I guarantee that I can break the fetch out 2, and they don't even bother raging the fetch out 2, and turns out the winning agenda was in archives anyway. I'm not gonna lie, while the game seemed like utter domination on my side, I got really lucky because I drew into the exact right cards I needed at each juncture of the game. 
so I was able to actually showcase how this deck worked overall. You saw how the credit denial was able to come into effect. Despite my opponent scoring a sales team and getting lots of money from hedge funds and IPOs, they were quickly drained by the double diversion of funds, the emergency shutdown on the 6 rest cost ice, as well as the gatekeeper being basically blanked by Cuban. Uh, that basically negates the rest cost of gatekeeper. They installed it for nothing. I countered it by playing Cuban. So in that sense, uh, Cuban kind of acts like uh, uh, it, it may as well be a, cutler, a piece of cutlery because the ice is essentially not there because sure I break it for two credits but then I get my two credits back. So the gatekeeper is just sitting there doing nothing. In fact, it's hogging server space and making subsequent ice installs more expensive. Those gang signs did so much work. Uh, it's super atypical. In most other games, you will only draw one or two gang signs by the time your opponent scores their first couple of agendas. So having three gang signs out against a corp that typically scores four agendas to win is a surefire way to, you know, shoot towards victory. And it really helped a lot that I drew into my Fisk Investment Seminars as well. Those gang signs stole a lot of agenda points, but they also allowed me to get up to the gatekeeper threshold and that was very key. Uh, it saved me... Because, as you saw, my Omakua was on four virus counters for the longest time. I could have ran Archives twice. Archives was open. But that would have been losing two clicks. Um, Gang Sign allowed me to get there clicklessly and allowed me to immediately threaten the next turn with a very nasty diversion of funds. The other thing to know about Gang Sign is um, my opponent... Uh, ended the game with four agenda points. Even though I suspect they drew a bunch of other agendas like remote enforcements and lots of hyperloops surely that they would be so tempted to score, they simply couldn't. Because if they attempted to score an agenda that didn't win them the game, I would get three gang sign accesses and probably win the game off there. I think their objective towards the end of the game was to draw into their three-pointer. Probably an Ikawa project uh, and attempt to score it. Well, turns I guess they didn't draw it, judging by how the game went. Cuban and Paragon paid out a lot. Uh, I did an analysis of the game logs and yeah, they, their payout was pretty good. Uh, while Paragon did not actually gain that many credits, it's really not that good a console, but it did save me a couple of clicks thanks to the ability that allows me to see what the top card is and bury cards that I didn't need at that moment. So that really helped. Uh, that being said, I think this deck is just not very good. I haven't played it extensively yet, but if you do give it a whirl, you'll find that it falls very easily to some of the tier 1 decks out there. Mti when Kundu is probably your biggest nightmare because they basically neuter all your run based stuff. The more you run, the more ice they install, the harder it is for you to break even on your runs. Your dirty laundries are blanked, you can't save the dirty laundry anywhere, not even empty servers, because who knows, they might stick a nasty ice in your face or something that ends the run. Uh, net damage from Nti Waikundu is also a huge, huge problem. You never want to take damage as 419 because you don't have very efficient click draw mechanisms. Fisk Investment Seminar isn't very is efficient, but it is very restrictive. You can't play it on the turn you draw it because typically uh, it wouldn't be your first click. So typically when you draw Fisk Investment Seminar, you have to wait the, for the next turn in order to play it and that delay is a huge deal when you're trying to find certain pieces. Uh, controlling the message is a huge, huge problem as well, even though you are allowed to run, well, you get stuck with tags if you do. I don't see any way around it. This deck is really poor, it doesn't run a lot of money, so you are going to get hit by hard hitting news at some point and you just won't be able to clear the tags. It also doesn't help that this deck has absolutely no way of contesting asset based economy. Um, I think the controlling the message matchup would be greatly boosted if you swapped out the Cubans and some other cards for three copies of Bankroll. Bankroll is amazing against CTM because uh, it gives you money while you're running and you want to be running very often against CTM. But more importantly, it stashes the money onto the Bankrolls so your money will not be uh, vulnerable to the likes of closed accounts. Uh, however, at the end of the day, even with Bankrolls, it's still not a very good matchup. You are still way too reliant on gang signs and turning, wheel, uh, turning wheels for uh, to nap those agendas. Without those cards, because you are tagged, they get trashed by the corp, you are just not going to see enough agendas to win the game. Enough non-QPM agendas, that is. Uh, the only upside really is that against CTM, you won't need to worry about virus counters because there will always be an open server against the ice-like CTM. 
you're going to get lots of virus counters. But the flip side is CTM won't bother purging virus counters either, meaning that you have a lot of dead cards in your deck like Fester. Wayland decks, well, there are lots of breeds of Wayland out there, but all of them have some way, shape, or form of just, you know, uh, ruining your day. Uh, typical kill Wayland has the same problem with CTM in that you just can't win those hard hitting news traces. Argus additionally imposes the meat damage tax every time you steal an agenda, and that is something that, as mentioned, like Mti Wakundu, you just can't take damage. It is too much of a tempo hit. Uh, in addition, Wayland has some really nasty end run ice, high strength, and trash your, your trash your programs as well. Archer and Titonium are absolutely terrible to face against. Um, yeah, meaning that you really cannot run unless you have at least six virus counters on Omakua. That's a tall ask a lot of the time. Finally, if you're up against a rig shooter deck like Scorpios with Marcus Batty, well, you I hope you're very good at side games. <laughs> That's all I can say. So all in all, um. Yeah, this deck just isn't very good. I just happened to run against into the one corp that I could deal with and I got a very good draw and it all worked out <coughs> swimmingly well. Right, that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed this innovative deck. Again, it's not very often I come up with these really interesting decks and this one's probably a bit too janky, but I hope you appreciate it nonetheless. Thanks for watching and happy net running. See you next time.